much for joining me again today. We are going to be talking about Colossians 1, uh, 24 through 2, 3 today. Let's pray as we get started. God, thank you so much for today, and thank you for the time that we get to gather together and open your word. I pray that as we read this letter to the Colossians, God, that you will speak to our hearts and that you will um, transform us through these words. God, we love you, and we pray all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. So again, we are going to be in Colossians. We're going to actually pick up right where we left off last week. Remember last week we talked through the intro to this letter and we talked through the poem about Christ's supremacy and we're going to continue to see this theme of the supremacy and centrality of Christ as we read through Colossians and we're going to see that today, we're going to see that next week, we're going to just continue to see this theme. And today as we start reading we're going to see more, learn a little bit more about Paul because it's going to be his further introduction of himself to the Colossians. Remember, he has not met these people. He was not a part of the founding of this church. That was Epaphras, whom he met in prison. And Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians and because of what he heard from Epaphras. So let's go ahead and just dive right in and read, and then we will talk about all these different pieces. I'm going to be reading uh, verses 24, 1, 24 through 2, 3, and I'll be reading out of the NIV. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we see here, Paul is continuing to introduce himself to these believers in Colossae. And he is, he starts off by talking about how he rejoices that he is suffering for them. And this idea of suffering on their behalf, almost as if Paul is saying he is drawing the enemy's fire so they have a chance to have a little bit of a respite from suffering. But then he goes on and he says some things that are very interesting. He says, He's, he fill, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And he says this, it's kind of interesting because at first glance, it's kind of, uh, I found it a little confusing. I thought about, and I read in the commentary I've been reading um, by N.T. Wright, he said that Paul's sufferings are tied to Christ. And as I kind of thought through this, and read a little bit more. It's this idea that what is true of Christ is also true of his people. Not that Paul is suffering and redeeming anybody, but that he is suffering and that as God's people, we are going to suffer and that that suffering should then in turn point others to, to Christ. That, and that, um, so we have that sense. And we also have the sense of what I said with Paul, almost that he's suffering on their behalf, kind of drawing the attention of those who want to persecute them and kind of take as much as he can and spare the others. But I think one of the interesting things here is that as Christ was known for his suffering, he was known by his suffering on the cross on our behalf, that we should, as his followers should be recognized 
by what we endure. And it kind of reminds me of some of the things that Jesus said to his followers about the cost of discipleship and talking about, you know, the Messiah came to suffer and one who is going to follow him will suffer as well. And as followers of Jesus, we should endure those sufferings differently than those who have no hope because we have the hope of Jesus. We have the hope of resurrection. We know the whole story. So the way we encounter difficulties, the way we encounter persecution and suffering should look differently. Then Paul goes on in verse 25 and he talks about being the servant of the church and how he is um, been how he's been commissioned by God. So we saw in the very first verse of chapter one, Paul calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And so Paul very much sees himself as commissioned by God to do God's work. And then he goes on and he continues to talk through this mystery. And so there, a lot in this section, we see the word mystery and it comes up and, is, and so he says in verse 26, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations. And we see this, we can, we can hear Jesus. Jesus is this mystery that has been kept hidden for ages, but it's now been revealed to God's people. And what's more, that God has chosen to make it known among the Gentiles. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the chosen people of Israel. It's now for everyone. And the Gentiles can know these the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Jesus, the, the plan of the gospel is a mystery because it was so unexpected. No one thought that God was going to reveal himself in through the person of Jesus, who was going to come and then suffer this horrific death at the hands of the Romans on a cross. No one thought that. That just doesn't make logical sense, right? When you think about someone coming in to rescue, coming in to save the world, that's not what people think is going to happen. It's so unexpected and it was a mystery. And nobody would have thought that would happen. But then once it was revealed, they began to understand what had been written about him before by the prophets and all throughout scripture. What a beautiful picture. And this, this idea of this mystery is going to continue to pop up that through, through this part of the letter and in, the, and in next week. And we're going to talk, talk about that a little bit more in depth as we continue to think about this. And Paul is going to continue on in verse 28 and 29 and talk about how uh, that God is at work. And because God is at work, Paul is at work doing, proclaiming and teaching and admonishing everyone so that everyone can be presented fully mature in Christ. And that this being made fully mature in Christ is something that is the work of the spirit. And it, that's how it is made possible. And it's this, this idea of being made more and more like Christ, that as we grow and we mature, that we look more and more like him and we live life in his way. And we, I think it's interesting because, so it says in verse 29, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. And this, the word contend here, this would have been uh, athletic imagery. Paul used athletic imagery a lot, actually, in his letters. This athletic imagery pops up and that would have been very culturally relevant to the world in which Paul operated the Romans, the Greeks, there were games and sport that you have the Olympic games, you have the Isthmian games, I would have been over by Corinth. And you have all of these different types of great feats of athletic endurance and things. So people would have been very well versed in athletic imagery, then as people are today. So Paul is talking about how he has continued to contend and work on their behalf. And he continues that as we start into chapter two. Want you to know how hard I'm contending for you, again, with that athletic imagery, that he is working and straining for them. 
And that even though, even though he hasn't met them personally, and he mentions Laodicea and how he's straining for and contending for them as well. And Paul says what his goal is here in verse two. It says, my goal is that they will be encouraged in heart and united in love that and, and understanding this unite being united in in love and through the gospel and understanding Christ's love, that they will be united together and that they may have the full riches of co complete understanding and know the mystery of God, namely Christ. And so we see this mystery language again pop up. And when we see that Christ is the mystery of God. So knowing, knowing Jesus is this treasure that he is talking about. Uh, let's see. Who in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? This mystery, Christ, this mystery is the treasure. He is the key to life. He is the key to the universe, as we saw um, in the hymn or in the poem in 1 15 through 20. He's the key to the, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the, the only one through whom we can experience true what it means to truly be human that we are completely restored. And I think it's interesting because it's it's for Paul, and we saw this in Philippians, for Paul, Christ is central. The fact that he didn't just like follow Jesus to have some sort of a spiritual experience or to feel better about himself. Following Jesus was what he did. Jesus was that central. We saw in Philippians 3, Verse eight, he talked about how everything was a loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. And this isn't just a simple statement of, oh, well, um, I, yeah, I believe in Jesus. No, this is, Jesus is central. He is life. There is nothing else that exists beyond that. To know him is the key to living life fully, To the key to living a and experiencing life in the truest sense of being human. And I think that is such a beautiful picture that following Jesus and letting him be the Lord of our lives to invite him and to do that is to choose to live life fully and to experience what it means to be fully human because he restores us. That is the depth of that redemption and that reconciliation that we see is he restores us completely. And we can experience that more fully. So there, this, this letter is very theologically rich and deep. And, and it really, if you stop and really start to ponder it, it can kind of hurt your head a little bit. And I know that because I've been studying it for a while now. And I love it though. I love that our faith is something that we can think deeply about. And I, I love to think about it. I'd like to, I love to talk about it and just, to kind of just really consider what it is that Jesus did. So I encourage you once again to just continue reading through this letter. Once a week, try to read through it in its entirety in one sitting. It won't take you very long. And just continue to see what God has to say to you through these words that Paul wrote so long ago. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I look forward to talking with you again next week as we continue going through this letter. Bye.